What's up? This is Seth Mosley. You're with us on the Made It in Music podcast. We've got a good one for you today. We've got David Wise and Laura Cooksey in the studio with us. And before I give you their intro, because it is a long one, their credits are quite impressive. So um, before we do that, just got a quick, quick announcement for you. I wanted to let you know about some awesome changes we've made to our Facebook group, which if you didn't know we had a Facebook group, we have a Facebook group. What was once our Song Chasers Facebook group has now been transformed into the Full Circle Music Learning Community, FCMLC. This group is the place to ask your specific music industry questions, to share all about the music industry news, and to give and receive advice as you pursue your music career. We also have some great mentors in this group that will be providing super valuable content every single week. They're going to share their many lessons learned as they're pursuing their own careers in the music industry. So to join the Facebook group, head to fullcirclemusic.com slash group. All right. Today, we're joined by David Wise and Laura Cooksey. David and Laura are music industry veterans who specialize in contracting, producing, and arranging vocals. And together, together... They have founded the 10 to 6 Music Group, 10 to 6 Music Group. We're going to talk about what that means in the interview. David's been a full-time session singer, arranger, and producer for over 20 years. He's the top, he is a top vocal contractor in Nashville and is rapidly becoming an in-demand producer. He's sung on thousands of recordings over the years. Some of his most recent work includes working with artists like One Republic, Lady Annabellum, Dolly Parton, Steve Green, Sandy Patty, and Walt Disney World. That's awesome. Dave is a Dove Award winner and recent nominee. Congratulations. And is also a well-respected arranger in Nashville in his arrangements published with Word Music, Lifeway Music, and J.W. Pepper. David's also arranged numerous vocals for Walt Disney World, Tokyo Disneyland, SeaWorld, and RCC. L. So that's just David. That's half of the intro. <laughs> Hang on, guys. Laura Cooksey. Laura has been a full-time session singer, worship artist, touring background singer, and featured soloist for over 15 years. She's toured singing background vocals and as a featured soloist for artists including Mandisa, Natalie Grant, Nicole C. Mullen, Matthew West, Michael W. Smith, and Amy Grant. As a session singer, she has sung on countless recordings, including Nashville Season 5 and 6. Great show, by the way. The mm-hmm. Emmy-nominated Superbrook theme song, Women of Faith Worship, Andrea Bocelli, Michael W. Smith, Christine DeMarco, and Mandisa. And Laura's extensive studio career has opened doors to studio and live vocal contracting over the last few years. Some of her most recent clients include Nashville Music Scoring for EA Games and Hans Zimmer, Disneyland, and Michael W. Smith. I am so excited to see what we're going to learn today from David and Laura on today's Made It in Music podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks for being on. Yeah, it's so fun. Your guys' credits is so long. It's like, man. It's super uncomfortable. I know. I totally hate that. People talking about what we've done. I mean, it's it's Better somebody else talking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. That's my least favorite thing when somebody sends me an email and says, hey, can you send your bio? I'm like, Tell us how awesome you are. Right. Right. I don't like that. (laughs) No, it's. I'm seriously excited. This is one that I've been personally looking forward to and- I know our people are going to get a ton out of it because we haven't talked a lot with people who are specifically session arranger, singer, vocal producers. Like yeah. that's that's uh, a part of the industry that fascinates me. You guys are so good at it. I mean, we've worked with each of you on a variety of things from yeah. choirs to vocal arrangements to singing backgrounds to all of the above. So. Right. Um, I would love to just dive in, and you guys can kind of bounce back and forth however you want to sure. answer questions. But Perfect. love to just hear how you guys got your start in music. Go ahead. I, I mean, I grew up um, as a lot of people who kind of I think end up doing music for um, for a living do. I grew up in church doing music, and I grew up in a church with great music programs. My mom was a church pianist. Um, I grew up doing great, like in great children's choirs and youth choirs, and then I went to Baylor. University as a classical voice major, but I always loved like music theater and pop music. And so I just always kind of tried to keep my hands in all of those genres, even as I was um, sort of honing in one specific area as a college student, you know, focusing on on classical voice and then ended up in Nashville. And the cool thing about being a session singer is that you're kind of called upon to do everything. Like one day it could be a country session, one day it could be 
like an off-screen acting thing for a television show. One day, one day it might be like coaching French for a classical choral session. And so what I love about what I get to do is I get to kind of pull on all of those um, sort of inspirations from my childhood and from, from growing up around music. Mm. So yeah. good. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, mine's super similar because I grew up in the church the same way as Laura did and was singing at, you know, three years old. For me, when I got to be seven, I, w- I was fascinated with the piano. So I started playing piano at seven. At 11, I started playing the French horn. So, I mean, I was super musical. I couldn't get my hands on enough stuff. And mm. it's funny, as you were saying that, I was trying to think of, you know, what were some of the defining moments in my life that really said to me, I really want to do this. And obviously there were groups that affected me. I'm a big acapella fan, so Take Six was big mm. when I was in you know high school. So I remember hearing that going, gosh, that blows my mind. I remember going to Disney and seeing the Voices of Liberty in ninth grade and thinking, I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? I was very inspired. When I was a senior in high school, I wanted my band to play the Looney Tunes theme because we had a huge band, and I thought, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift that. And so I can remember sitting in my living room, trying to lift note for note what they were doing on that. And so ever since I was a kid, it just always was something. It was really what I was great at. I was terrible at algebra and geometry and anything school related, but music I always excelled at. So I went into college and started playing French horn and piano there, played jazz piano, and ended up switching over to voice. And uh, my senior year, I, I actually got to sing with Voices of Liberty. I got cast to go sing at Disney, and that's kind of what started the whole thing for me is that one thing led to another, and next thing I know, here I am working full-time at Disney, and the rest was kind of history. And it's really cool how God orchestrated it through my whole career because now with all the producing and arranging and stuff I do, I go back and look at, you know, playing the French horn affected me now. Mm. Playing the piano, best skill, best skill I've learned in my career is piano. I mean, it really, Mm. everything I do is based on it, but it's just, it was all a domino effect to get me to where I am now. So it's really cool how God pieced it all together when I didn't really kind of see, I didn't know that this is where I would end up, but all the pieces kind of fit together now. That's so good. It's kind of cool. What's something that each of you, 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 as as you've been in the industry full-time for a long time now, what is something that each of you guys has learned that maybe wasn't something you knew before getting into it? It's like, there's a lot of stuff you can learn in school. You can get your college degree, but until you actually jump in. Well, you know, I'll feel this first just to say I think it's just so much harder than people realize. That's the thing that I've realized, you know, is that, you know, I've spent lots of years mentoring people and, and talking to people. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten the call. Oh, yeah, I want to be a session singer. I mean, that looks like that would be fun. Hmm. Yeah, it is fun, but it's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's I mean, I've been doing this now for over 20 years. And I still never find myself in a moment where I can relax. Mm. You know what I mean? As far as continuously pursuing, continuously pursuing clients, continuously learning. Mm. You know what I mean? Like people go to college and that was just the very tip of the iceberg of what my learning experience was going to be. And so I think when I was young, I was naive because I got cast in great things. It got great experiences. Yet... I don't think I really realized the grind that really goes Mm -hmm. with it. Because if you don't continue to learn, if you don't continue to build relationships, if you don't continue to grow yourself as a musician, you're never going to keep up. Because the fact is, is that by the time you get 30, there are 20-year-olds who are coming who have learned a whole new set of skills. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, well, now I have to reinvent myself because I have to be able to compete with these people. Mm -hmm. And that never stops. And so I think think that was eye-opening for me. I've learned it now, obviously, but it's just... It's just so important to never stop. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think sort of on the flip side of that, one of the one of the biggest things that I've, I've observed from living here now and working in the industry for a long time is that all of that is required. Like a, a very strong work ethic is like foundational without a doubt. Then on top of that is really having good musical instincts. Mm. And that's something that you really can't teach. You kind of either have it or you don't. And I think the way that plays itself out and the people who are most successful in this field have really good musical instincts because when they walk into a session, instinctively they know what they need to do that day to Mm. do their job well. Mm. Stylistically, um, you know, from a genre perspective. And so I think, I think that's, it's kind of a both and. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just to piggyback off of that, yeah, the musical instinct is very important. I think to make it in music, you have to have at least a, a modicum of it, a baseline of it. Yeah. Right. 
But then I do think, and I've, I've seen this for myself over years, over the years, is you can get better at it. For like, sure. It's, 100%. It, it isn't always what I've seen, the most amazing, talented people who break in and they're the ones who stick around. It's just, it's the ones who stick around and <laughs> totally. they yeah. develop and it's, it. And so. I, I also think just with coupled with that is the relationships. You know what I mean? Like people want to work with people they want to be in a room with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you want to work with somebody who comes in like they're mentally prepared, they're ready to go, they're willing to do whatever you want them to do. Those are the people you want to be around. Yeah. So, you know, I always used to say to people in Nashville, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of talented people. Mm. There's also thousands and thousands of talented people that are working and thousands of people that are not working. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so it's just... It's placing yourself in the right position, and when you get those opportunities, it's building the relationships with people, and it's doing your job to make sure that you're prepared when those opportunities come around. Mm. Mm-hmm. So good. So tell us more about 1026 Music Group. I'm sure everybody's watching out there is like, what is 1026? <laughs> That's like makes no sense. What is it? Okay, so in Nashville, and I didn't learn this because I started my career in Orlando. So, I mean, when I was doing Disney stuff, I mean, we'd get called from a session for a session. They'd say, yeah, you know, it's a nine to five or whatever the session would be. And when I first moved to Nashville, people started using this lingo. They're like, hey, yeah, I'm calling you. Are you available for a 10? And I was like, Ten dollar, ten dollar. Like I didn't understand what it was, and then I'd I'm get a little a, more than that. I, I, right, I'd get a call from somebody, and they'd say, "Hey, we need you for a ten and a two this day." And finally, I asked one of my buddies, "I'm like, man, what are they talking about?" And they're like, "Well, sessions are booked in blocks in Nashville for the most part. So if you get called for a ten, it's a three hour session, so a ten to one, and then two to five. And so people used to make jokes in the studio all the time about, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm booked. I have a ten to six meaning they had a 10 o'clock, a 2 o'clock, and a 6 o'clock session because they're working a lot, and it meant that they were in demand. And I thought, man, that's really cool that no one else anywhere defines studio times as that except for Nashville. It's kind of unique to, to us. And so I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if I if we branded the company together? And so we just kind of threw it around. And I had come up with a name for a while. I was sitting on it. I was actually going to do something different with it. Mm. And then Laura and I partnered together, and we realized we wanted to do this contracting thing. And I said, well, hey. I've got this name I've been sitting on and it just kind of, it fit because it was unique to us. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And we really started the group because living in Nashville, I heard a producer say working in Nashville is a little bit like living in the wild, wild west because Mm. (laughs) it's sort of anything goes, you know, like whereas in LA and New York, you have unions um, that really kind of run, run the show and set the standard of what's what for projects and for artists. And, we have we are members of of SAG after ourselves, but we live in a right to work state. And so every project that we take on as contractors and as singers, like when it might be on or off the card, like you'll hear us talk about that a lot. And um, anyway, so kind of living in this sort of wild, wild west world where rates for different projects vary based on is it a custom project? Is it a label project? Is it a um, what we realized is that as people were looking for singers coming to town, because there's a lot of orchestral work that's come to town in the last couple of years because we are a right to work state for different video games, television shows, uh, film scores. Um, they were starting to look for vocals for things and they were calling saying, hey, do you have a singer that can do this? Or do you have a group of singers that can make like this kind of sound? Like we need sort of like a Westminster Abbey kind of sounding choir or mm. We need a killer gospel uh, female vocalist. Um, What we realized is that there was nobody in Nashville sort of curating a group of singers that was sort of a one-stop shop for people when they Mm. were looking for singers for different projects. That exists in L.A., it exists in New York, but it didn't yet exist here. So it was sort Mm. of like, hey, who do you know that you can, you know, Um, which is cool. But I think what we've been able to do is come into this space and provide what we like to call it as a vocal greenhouse of sorts where we've got this curated roster of about 50 singers that we Mm. pull from all the time based on different needs and based on different projects that we're working on. And that's been really fun, and it's opened a lot of really cool doors for us. Totally. And what's great, too, is that, you know, if 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 you were to go to Nashville and just move to Nashville and you went, man, I'm a singer, I'm a really good reader, I feel like I'm really versatile with my voice, I want to be a session singer. That's really something I'm really I'm ready to do the hard work, all that stuff. You wouldn't have no idea where to go. I mean, you would just have no idea where to start. 
And back in the day, you just had, it used to be relationships. I mean, you just knew a person who knew a person who knew a person who could sing, and you're like, hey, call this person, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we figured with doing this, what we would do is also provide a resource for the actual talent, for people to reach out to us to go, hey, I've been wanting to move to Nashville. This is what I want to do. You guys look like you're a great fit. What can I learn? And we we get those emails constantly from people that are saying, hey, I'm interested. This is something I've been wanting to do. Can you tell me what to do? You're, you, you look like you're the place that could help me. And so that was really what our goal is because, I mean, look, we're not foolish. We realize – I mean, I don't want to say I'm on the back end of my career. I'm not going to say that because I'm not. I feel like I'm right in the middle. Not at all. I feel like I'm right in the middle. But what (laughs) I do realize is that I realize in 10 or 15 years when we're not singing as much, it's our responsibility to raise up other great singers and teach them. Because, look, there's no school that you can go to. I don't care what anybody says that will ever teach you what doing sessions is like until you're actually doing sessions. It's just, we hear it from college kids all the time. Like they come from really phenomenal programs where they learn so much of the technique of singing and they learn, they learn things that are important in college, which we both had, which we both had. And we're like, like the technique is a huge thing. That's why I'm still singing at 45, you know, Mm -hmm. however, you can't learn how to be a session singer until you do sessions. And yeah, so we're yeah, trying to raise up higher. a generation yeah. of people that will come back and, and keep the level of what Nashville is known for. That's really what our passion is. Yeah. With that, we started uh, the past two years, and we won't do it this year because of, of COVID, um, kind of getting in the way of it. But for the past two years, we've done a class called In Session. Mm. And that's been really cool because we've brought in some of our veteran session singers and we well, we did it at the tracking room, which is no longer We're in town. Morning. But yeah, we, yeah. We, we take a studio. We kind of take a studio over for the evening. and It's about a four-hour uh, studio intensive. And mm. we have typically between 40 and 50 attendees, and we get them up on mics in different mm. groups. And it's just trial by fire. It's like, here, this is a um, – chart that's printed out and you have the notes to read on the page we're going to do this Mm. here's a chart that's just lyrics so your how's your ear you know like we're going to work on developing that skill um and we sort of take people through the process of what being a studio singer really looks like from a to z like everything from studio etiquette to how to sing on the mic to if you're singing If there are three sopranos on the stand and there's one in the middle, like whose sound are we going to? All those kind of nuancey things. Even simple stuff. I mean, there's things that you would never think of that are things that it's always funny to me when we mention simple things, people's eyes light up and they're like, oh, gosh, I never would have even thought about that. You know what I mean? But it's stuff that's common nature to us because we do it all the time. But to someone that's new, they would never think. And look, we've found singers that we currently use on our roster that we found from both of our session classes that we've yeah. done. So that's been that's really awesome. cool because there's so much talent out there, as you very well know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's – and I, I want to dissect a little bit of what you said for a second, but I'm always, you know, no listener left behind. Can you talk a little bit about the right-to-work state? Because I think that's a really significant change that's happening right now. There's I'm going to let you – A lot of California – really is what I think you're talking about. A lot of California is coming to Nashville, and this is one of the big reasons. And it's, you know, I'm not going to get into the political ends of things. but Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I I can't speak about it extremely intelligently. I can talk about it from the way that it sort of affects us. But what it basically means um, to live in a right to work state is that there is no there are no union rules that supersede your right to work. And so um, what what that means is that a film a movie house may be able to come here and cut the orchestra. <laughs> for a significantly uh, lower cost yeah. than what it would take to do it through the union based on union laws and based on union rates um, in California or even in London. They have their own union over there. It's a whole different deal. And so for us, what it allows us to do living in Tennessee is it can kind of be the best of both worlds as it allows us to work for the union, like I just did something this week for Netflix remotely from, you know, which is awesome. Um, and then it allows us to work off the card where we can do a custom project for a, you know, flat hourly rate. Yeah. And, and off the card basically means non-union. For people that, yeah, it's non-union. Yes, so it's correct. just I make a deal with you X amount of dollars for X session. Sort of based and that's a on custom your project. total budget. Yes, yeah. correct. Right. And, uh, and also the fact is a large portion of what we do in town is uh, demo music. It's a huge deal. So, like, for example, in California, you don't see as much of that as you do as you do here. And a lot of these big companies are signatories. And so they're required for it to 
be on the card. I mean, that's just what they have to Meaning do. Meaning if you're if you're Warner Brothers or Sony, you have to run through the union. That's Correct. exactly right. Yeah. And you, you have to. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a project right now out in California that's Warner that has to be run. It just doesn't matter. Even though I live here, it still has to be done that way. However, here we do so much choral demo work here. And that stuff's really demo work. It's not anything that's for sale. Like the, the reason they use these things is to demo the piece of music that's for sale. That piece of music you can buy, yeah. but you're not really buying. A, you're not buying a sound recording of what yeah. we're doing. It's mm-hmm. just the demo. And so because of that, that's also a huge part of our work. And so we we couldn't survive any other way, honestly, if it was one or the other. Mm-hmm. So it's really a luxury here in Nashville that we have the opportunity to do both. So basically what you're saying is singers that live in L.A. should basically move to Nashville. Totally. <laughs> well, t- <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, it's it's there's kind of a give and take to it because I think we have this conversation all the time. Some of our L.A. friends work a lot less for a lot more, and they'll see things like residuals, that if yeah. you go in and do a one-time project – and it's it's a non-union project, then you're just going to get paid for that job and you move on. And that's we're we're very accustomed to that. <laughs> L.A. singers would have a hard time, you know, sure. union singers adjusting to that because it's awesome to open up your mailbox and get a residual check. Yeah, for a project, just, you know? and that's what a lot of people don't realize. And I, I want to hit on that. You you brought up SAG and AFTRA, and I, I want in a minute just to break down what that is and why that's sure. important. But it, you, you're talking about basically. A completely different system where when you're when you're doing something that's on the union card and this goes for musicians as well too on sessions that we work on mm-hmm. records that are on or through union cards you get a back-end royalty through sag or aftra and, totally and, and it and makes so. a difference too whether it's you know television or whether it's a sound recording or whatever that looks like so say you do a commercial and you know you get paid X amount of dollars, well, then wherever it airs and how many ever times it airs and or whatever, a TV episode, how many episodes it gets or whatever, there's a structure. And, and that's really – it just goes to show how our world works. It's just – it's different in different places. You can find that financially – if you were to take two singers, you know, a singer from L.A. and a singer from Nashville, it's probably pretty comparable financially where we're landing. It's just different because here we work a lot more yeah. to reach the same amount. There they work a lot less, but they go in and they do a big session that's on the card, and then they see the fruits of that. So, But it's a trade-off because it's three times as much to, to live, live there, there, too. So exactly. It totally is. I do so think probably, they make probably more, is. but I think it levels out based on the cost yeah. of living. Cost that's, of living that's, out there. It, gosh, yeah. we've got amazing friends that live out there and are just have had brilliant brilliant careers and just they're just we're you know they're amazing um i know here as times have changed one thing we've really strived for is really trying to get more of that union work and have a lot of that sag after work simply for exactly what laura just said and what you said as well it's it's for the residual back end that's really the part that makes a really nice difference because believe me ain't nothing wrong with getting that extra check in your mailbox after you've done a project and two years later you go hey we're paying for this again and you know Merry yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Is, there a, is there a strategy to to that for you guys? I mean, obviously, it's, you know, when you're working with a major label, it's kind of, you know, just understood that, it, that it's going to run through the union. But is there – is that just sort of building relationships with people who are in, in those I think major so. label worlds? I think so. I think – well, and here's the thing. I mean, as you know, I mean, look, we've been working for you now a couple of years, and we were a bit of a novelty when we started working together because we yeah. were a new company, and you had never used anybody like us. And so now we've got this great relationship, and you know what we can do. That's really what we're trying to do now with other producers is mm-hmm. we're just trying to say, hey, look. We we had a session yesterday and it was it was super fun for an artist and um, gospel choir thing and mm-hmm. I was able to write the arrangement ahead of time and we were able to go in and the singers walked in and they just sang it and it was what it is and it's so funny because one of the people in the room were like man where'd you guys come from we just didn't even know you did this and yeah. and so with that comes us trying to change the culture a little bit because so many times I mean you know Nashville. Mm-hmm. As well as I do. Yeah. And how many times is it that you're working on a project for a CCM thing or whatever, and you've got somebody in the back room and you need somebody to come stick some vocals on it real quick? And you're like, hey, <laughs> hey, you, okay, you sing. <laughs> can you do have a voice? Can you come and sing? And, Ooh, and, and you yeah. know what? And not every project, some project that we're great for, but some projects it doesn't. And you really need a specific thing. And so what we're trying to do is let producers see, hey. A, this is what we can offer. This is the gamut of all the stuff that we can do. But B, we want to try to move over to stuff. Hey, if it can be on the card, it really doesn't affect you very much, but it really affects us on the other end because it yeah. makes a big difference long term. So yeah, it's a totally. it's a slow game. We're just trying to change a little bit of the pattern, you know? Yeah. 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 
that makes total sense. And we and we get it too from from our end of things as well. You know, if we're if we're able to and, and we're working on a project that's, you know, well funded by a major label, then we very much as producers, you know, believe in taking care of everybody we yeah. work with as much, as well as we can. So yeah. but um but it but it involves flexibility and I, I love that that's what a big part of what you guys are passionate about is is being flexible and being able to sort of step in and serve. Um which is I think a big takeaway for people listening is that to to make a career as a session singer, you've got to pretty much be able to sort of plug in and be a chameleon. Is that, am I saying that right? Absolutely. And that's the thing. Like there are a lot of great singers who will run across, like they might be amazing country demo singers. Yeah. But if I need to throw you on a choral, you know, legit choir for Disney, mm-hmm. I can't do that. Or there might be a singer who's a fantastic um, classical singer. But if you need him to do like a pop, vocal it's not in their wheelhouse and Mm. so really i think it's kind of back to what we mentioned earlier but i really do think the most successful people in our little niche of the industry are people who are really can be chameleons and serve whatever the project needs you know and i think everybody we all know that we have limitations so i know like and this has probably happened to me a total of like four times in all my years of, of working here but if I hear a song and they're like hey we'd love for you to come do this I'm like that's not me hmm. but here's who you need to call yeah so I think it's also knowing your strengths and really owning those and then if there's something that comes along because it's bound to happen that might not be the best thing for you being like yeah that's not really great for me I, I won't give you the best that you hmm. could have there but here's who I would recommend and I I think people appreciate well you're that. making the client happy more happy at that point because it's Yes. Custom for that thing. Totally. totally. And here's the thing. I mean, look, we have, and I think this is pretty accurate, we have about 50 people on our roster. Honestly, about half of those people are people that we use in our background Where? singing session group because that's a special niche within what we do. Mm-hmm. The other half are all unbelievable soloists that we can use. People, and our website's set up in a great way. Where people can go and they can say to me or Laura, they can say, hey, we're looking for a person that can do this. And I can say, go to our website, check out these three people. I think they're really going to fit what you need. Mm -hmm. And that's a great place that they fit. The other thing about contracting that kind of thing and being on our roster is understanding that, you know, these people are people we do life with all the time. I mean, these are when I first moved to Nashville, this was my clan. This is my crew. Mm -hmm. And they still are. And I love them all dearly. I think as contractors, one thing Laura and I think have been really great at is really dividing the line between who's the person I necessarily want to hang out with in the session and who's the best person for the client. And, and, And that's to me, that's how you are a good contractor is because I can't tell you how many times like we would do a session and I'm not going to sing because I know that there's another person that fits the sound better than me. And I know that I'm better served producing Mm -hmm. and directing the vocals. And so that's what I do. I find a way to work it that way. And, and Laura is so great. I mean, that's one of her big gifts is that she's really good at piecing vocalists together and putting them together, but it's about meeting the client's needs. And I think that's one thing I think we've done really well. And I think that's why we're continuing to work as much as we are is because it really is a business. I mean, that's what it is. And so, I, that's one thing I, I pride ourselves in and what we do. Well, and, yeah. and you guys, it's, you know, it's it's just what you do. So it's 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 not necessarily intentional. But the, the thing I was going to say is you guys have pretty good job security in the sense that there's a lot of really good technology for, hey, I, if I need a banjo on a track, I'll pull up Real the Banjo. It's on contact, and it sounds like a banjo player. Mm-hmm. Right. If I need a drummer, just open up whatever plug-in you can't do that with singers and choirs like they've tried no, you can <laughs> kind of do it with the choir but even even it was an oz maybe but and even that i can't tell you how many things we've gone in to sweeten over the top of it Just yeah because you, you cannot mimic the human voice it's well, you the human can't, thing you can't mimic emotion right yeah. right period there's yeah. no sample that you can put on that can have the same emotion as a real person that's reacting to a track that they're listening or, to. And it's singing a specific lyric. That's yeah. exactly totally. right. Yeah. Well, and even a sound, even if you're pulling like an ooh or an ah, it's still one person most of the time. So even as you stack that, or it's just still one person's thing, but it can never mimic a, qu- a group. Like a group. Yeah. 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 yeah, three stacks of a choir, you're going to get unique 
sound each different time. I mean, whether it's changing a space in the room, putting somebody different in front of the microphone, I mean, sonically, it's going to be different. And you just, you can't replicate that with a sample. No. We're, we're glad. <laughs> you, and and, and for, fortunately, <laughs> until, somebody, until somebody comes out with an AI choir, which maybe you guys are working on, I don't know. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> That's way over our head. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you guys really want to, that's, that could be your thing, but no, 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 I, 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 I love it. It's honestly one of my favorite things we get to do on, on records and we don't get to do it on a lot of records. Cause you know, choirs and groups, background vocals aren't always the, you know, the right thing stylistically sure. for what we do often, but it's one of my favorite things to do because you're totally right. It's like, you, you just, you, the song kind of comes to life in a whole new way. And I, I, I just love seeing artists' faces when they hear their songs. And then you guys step up on the mic or your singers step up on the mic and, and there's this group. And the way that you can even take, it's it's really amazing. It, if, if you get to kind of witness what they do, it sounds like a full like chamber choir by the end of it. And it's mm-hmm. ma- sometimes maybe only three or four people, but you just know how to get them to, to layer and stack and... Thanks. And it's yeah. and to me, you know, one of the things that I love about what we do is how we can give the artist something different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like when an artist, like it happened yesterday with this artist, they had a great song. It was really great. Fantastic. Done. Next thing, the choir came in. She realized that we had the ability to not take away from what she was doing, but to honor her yeah. and to give her something else different that took the song to a whole different place, yet still let the main thing be the main thing. Because, you know, there's so many times you can get in the way of what's going on. And I think it's about having that tasteful thing about knowing, hey, we're here to just give you support and just give you, you know, and to see their, the smile on their face when they see that and to see yeah. their reaction, it really yeah. is it really is priceless. And that, yeah. it's happened with us, with you yeah. on, oh, yeah. on Zoom calls on when Zoom the calls, artist exactly. is going, yeah. oh my gosh, like this is yeah. really so cool. That to me makes it all worth it. Yeah, it's so fun. Yeah. yeah, and I think we're seeing a little bit of a revival with BGVs and 100%. vocal arrangements. 100%. Like we went through kind of a sad season where they were <laughs> either the artists would do them all themselves or they just wasn't, it was just more of a strip down acoustic vibe sort yeah. of a season with a lot of the music that happens here but like in the 80s and 90s I mean there was such an art to BGV arranging yeah. mm-hmm. and I mean you go back and listen to some of those recordings and it's insane what those singers were doing yeah. and I think we're we're kind of it's part of what we're doing is kind of trying to be like guys this is a good idea like you want this on your song or on your record oh man you know? we we had a moment in the studio just a couple weeks ago I was with the Rhythm and Rhythm guys and we were cutting an old Sandy Patty song and all of a sudden one of the guys went oh we have to listen to this and we pulled out one of her albums from the 90s and I'm just telling you we just went to school and just all for 30 minutes we lost mm. track of time listening to the background vocals and all the intricate stuff that they were doing and it was so complicated but it made the song it i mean just it. as much as the horn chart made it the background everything had a, a space you know in the recording so i'm just we're glad that it's coming back a little it bit it really is yeah. and i mean you're listening you're seeing new guys even if they're doing it themselves you know i, I don't know what how he does it but jacob collier totally oh like his stuff is mind so blowing. vocally mind-blowing 100 percent. and i love that you know if you go back and look at where he started Go back and look at some of the first videos he did. They were all a cappella. No one even knew that he played all these instruments and did all this stuff. What he did was a cappella. And it was his chord structures and his chord alterations and stuff that he did that people were going, oh my gosh, what is this? And then he added all this other element to it to where it's just this musical festival in your yeah. ears. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just amazing. Even Tori Kelly, like she has great yeah, she's a great example. on her oh, records. Yes. I, yeah. I think they're, I'm hopeful. I feel like it's it's making a comeback. So we're hoping to I think right. it absolutely is. And, yeah. and you're just seeing fusions right now of, you know, you put your, if I put my crystal ball hat on, you know, as, as, as best I can and predict which future music is going to be, it doesn't take a scientist to see that all the genres are kind of just swimming in this pool of playlists and mm-hmm. yeah. and I love that because it's more diversity in music yeah. mm-hmm. and I think what you said you know I, I always I always say that the, the most two powerful pieces of gear in any studio are number one a hit song and number two the human voice mm-hmm. 100% and you can do so much with a voice on, on a record yeah. oh yeah it's, it's just so true. it's amazing yeah. So can you guys talk a little bit about, um, yeah, what uh, the, the day-to-day, the process, what goes into 
music and vocal contracting? Like, what is what does that actually look like? So I can sort of talk you through a huge project that we're sort of working on now. And what that looks like is we're touching base uh, two to three days a week, two to three times a week to say, hey, we've got this project coming up. We've got four days worth of vocals that we're going to need. Two days we're going to need more of a legit sounding choir. One day we're going to need more of a gospel choir. They want 14 singers this day. They want 19 singers this day. This day is a small group of five singers. And then we start talking about the sound. So if there's a demo to listen to, um, then we always ask for that because that informs so much about who we want to put, the personnel we want to put in the room. Mm-hmm. And we want to make sure we get the right people, and that helps so much. And then we ask the producer questions like, what sound are you going for? What's the vibe the artist wants here? And that also helps us sort of think strategically about the singers that we want to pull together. And, and then, references are, from my perspective, probably the most helpful thing we absolutely, can give, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's so helpful. And then what we'll do from there is go through our list of kind of core singers that we use, and we'll send out what's called a Can You Work hmm. email. And so we'll send them Very an email. Very scientific name. I like yes. it. Yes. <laughs> Can You Work. Um, <laughs> and so we will shoot that out to our singers, wait to hear back, and then we'll get moving on the project, kind of get into the weeds, and we'll figure out, does David need to do a vocal arrangement on this? Or is this something we're going to kind of come up with the fly? Does the artist already know exactly what they want? And so we get into the weeds of the details a little bit more at that point. And then the day before the session, we send out a reminder call And then the day of the session, we make sure that we're there a little earlier than everybody else and we're communicating. We're sort of the liaison between the singers that we've contracted and the producer and artist if they happen to be there. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's another caveat that I too. That's the the easy part because when it gets difficult is that you're navigating – 19 people schedules. Yeah. And right. so because of that, you have your starting list and then right. you have your, oh, shoot, this person can't be there. Who am I going to put into their place? Oh, there's another session that day. Oh, great. That's right. Because yeah. that, that <laughs> happens, too. And, and to me, yeah. one thing that it's big, especially nowadays, is, you know, when that when that happens and we lose too many singers, we're the first contractors that will call our client and go, listen, if you want the best, we need to move this to another yeah. day. Yeah. You, you have to do that. But again, it's about navigating people's schedule. And then it's so crucial that when we come up with this, you know, 14 or 19 group of singers, it's very specific. I mean, it's not just random. It's really been thought through. And we've talked about sound and we've talked about splitting parts and we've talked about reading. I mean, there's just so many elements that went into that. When you lose one person, it's not just a, oh, well, let's just put this person in their spot. It's, it, it, it's It's how yeah. you balance it because it may yeah. be, well, hey, I've got this person on baritone, but they really could sing second tenor because it'd be better to bring this baritone. You know what I mean? And so it's about putting the puzzle together and still keeping the integrity of the project intact. Yeah. yeah. And my favorite part about all of that, David mentioned it a little bit earlier, but is really getting into the nuance of people's tones and timbres. Like this person has a little bit more of an edge to their voice. This person brings a little bit more of a rounder warmer tone. So together, it's going to be killer. This Mm. person brings more air and we need that. And so figuring out those little puzzle pieces is one of my favorite parts about what we do. And I let her do it because she's way better. (laughs) I love it. I'd rather just let me arrange the notes. Let me do the chart. That's the part I want to do because that's the nerd in me that wants to wants to do that. But yeah. but that stuff matters too. And yeah. that's the part that I think makes what we do in art yeah. is because it's just like a painting. You know what I mean? It's the right color palette and the right colors mixed together. It's the same thing with vocals because mm-hmm. if you get three really bright singers in a room, I mean, you're just going to have edge for days and you're right. not going to Unless have... you're doing a bluegrass project. That's right. Probably. Right. Well, and, and again, <laughs> well, we yeah. always call it like, for example, we call it, there's usually one singer on the stand that's the glue. And that person is Mm -hmm. their job is to take, you know, two bright singers that they're standing in between and they've got warmth to their voice. How does that warmth of their voice connect those two voices so it feels like a stand of singers rather than three individual singers? Mm -hmm. That's so good. And and I can definitely speak from experience. You guys know what you're talking about. When you're talking about a 14 and a 19 piece choir, are those specific numbers like they are? Is that like... uh, like, why 14, why 19? Right, it's arbitrary. What's, what's the, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, like, in the 14-person choir, it's, like, four sopranos and four altos, three tenors and three basses. And so that's how you get your number 14. And part of the reason we do that is that, you know, the human voice is a very interesting thing. And guys are louder than girls. It mm-hmm. just is what it is. I mean, we can sing the girls out of the room mm-hmm. without even trying. And part of that is because the tessitura 
That's a fancy word. But the tessitura of where our voice sits, a lot of times we're singing things that are higher. And a guy can chest voice and sing with a lot more power there than a girl can. Because when it gets high into a girl's range, a girl can't chest that. She has to switch. I and, mean, she can. Well, she can, but, but it's, not. it's not necessarily appropriate for the sound. The sound needs girls to have. Girls can do anything that guys can Yes, they can. right. I better. have two daughters. That's right. Yes, they can. But my point is, is that their sound may be a taller, legit sound. And so while they can put out sound, they can't even compare with the guys so we in a situation like that it's just physiologically different yeah. that's right so we balance the room different so that there are more females than there are males just as you're capturing because you know a lot of times if we're getting technical when we're doing a choir session we'll have a mic on individual stands so there'll be a soprano alto tenor and bass mic but we're also really capturing the room and so the engineer will set up in the corners multiple mm-hmm. you know he may have a pair of ribbon mics or whatever that he's setting up a couple different pair of room mics because sometimes when you're in a great room with a choir it just, you just it's want the room. actually the balance of the room stacked that makes it sound like a choir because it's not individual people so i mean again that's yeah. just another layer of numbers in, in the room yeah how uh and we'll get a little nerdy for a second, but can you talk about, like, is there an, an optimal room size or does that not really matter as much? I think it matters based on the project that right. we're doing. Like, And you'll know that, like, especially if you get a ref from a producer or from an artist and you'll hear, like, okay, how much, like, over-the-top kind of sound, like, ambient sound is there? Do we want that? Do we need that within the room? I, you, there's some of that that you can, you know, add in from a programming standpoint sure. but there's nothing like capturing the room when you need the room yeah. um, and there are other times when we need a bit of a closed mic sound and we don't want a really live room mm-hmm. um, and so I think we're always mindful of that. We are. I mean, if we're doing something a cappella, like actually there's two different sides of that. I mean, we've done a cappella stuff where it's leaning in the pentatonic side where you want a tight room and you want to be able to melodyne it and you want to be able to tune it and all that kind of stuff. So you really need that. And then there's the flip side of that. We just did an a cappella thing a couple weeks ago and it was an old school a cappella thing. Mm. And when we listened back, it was the ribbon mics in this specific room that made all the difference because mm-hmm. it had really tall ceilings. Mm-hmm. So that sound had a, a, a great so, place yeah. to, to live. Yeah. And so you're getting, and the mics were really high too. So you're getting the sound up and it's, it, you have to hear it to understand it, but it really, it, cha- it changed the sound. Like we played this, we mm-hmm. played the session with the close mics and just a little bit of the room mics and it sounded great. But then we muted all the close mics and just played the ribbon mics of the room, mm-hmm. and it sounded like this old vintage thing this because killer. of the yeah. room. Because they're, yeah. and now to piggyback on that, I do want to say something because this is important to us. There are also rooms we hate singing in. I mean, yeah. seriously, there are rooms in town we don't like singing in. And it's not that they're not great rooms because they work great for rhythm or they work great for something else, but for us. When we're singing in a room, we have to have some sort of reflection for ourselves to be able to get something back. And if we sing in a room that's too dead, I mean, we've both done sessions where we sing all day for six hours. And it's like you're singing into a blanket or you're singing into a brick wall. And it's harder because you find yourself overcompensating in a room that's suited for singing. You, you, you don't have to do that because mm-hmm. it's just such a natural thing. You, you're getting a reflection back. And so that's sure. a that's a big deal, too. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. yeah. That makes total sense. Um, So what advice would you give somebody wanting to pursue a career in the music industry and maybe even more specifically going into the music industry as a singer? I think we've we've touched on this a little bit, but one of the things I would say is be as well versed as you can in, Mm -hmm. in every I mean, in all genres, but also. Read music. Like if, mm. That's huge. Mm. Um, there are a lot of sessions in town that we have great singers. Um, we have a great roster of singers, but if it calls for sight reading and we only, the, like the budget only allows for an hour and a half to get a song done or whatever, then we've got to hire. Sometimes we have to hire the better reader over the better singer. Mm. Now, there are other projects where at the end of the day, the producer will say, I don't care. The thing that matters most to me is the sound. Mm. And so there's a give and take there, you know. But when we're hiring any, when we're hiring for any session that we know there's going to be printed sheet music on, we have to make sure that we have at least one strong reader on every stand. Mm. And if you are a strong reader, you will work more. Mm. And if you are a really strong reader, but you have an underdeveloped ear, then develop your ear. Hmm. Listen to music and sing it back. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a really strong ear and can't read, learn to read. So it's really developing both sides of, of those skills uh, and, for sure, I think, is huge to being successful. So is that, you know, as far as learning to sight read music, and I'm, I'm asking this question just because that's one thing that I, I took like two years of piano lessons when I was five and six. I can tell you every good boy does fine, fine. but right. my, music theor- my music theory peters out fairly quickly after that. I yeah. just, I, I've figured out how to make it work without that. That said, I could never be a session singer yeah. <laughs> for, for multiple reasons. But what is what is the best way for someone to go about learning to do that? Is it vocal lessons? Is it, what, what is it? Well, you know, well, one thing, just I want to make sure I clarify, because this is such a, such a really important part of what we do. And I get this question asked to me often when I say, well, do you read music? And their response is, oh, yeah, I read. I mean, like, there's an alto part. I can, follow, I can follow it. And then I ask them again, no, no, no. Can you walk into the room? Can you read what's on the page correctly the first time you By see it? By yourself. Because yeah. that's what people don't understand. When we do reading sessions in town, I can't tell you how many singers I've invited and I've said, hey, why don't you come and watch a session one time before you say that this yeah. is what you want to do and see it? They walk in and we start reading. And sometimes we do what's called reading in red. I mean, if we know the song, if we're familiar, if it's a worship song and we're doing a choral arrangement, we pretty much can roll it. And every person in that room will read the music mm-hmm. off, the, off the page instantly. And the people always say, oh, my gosh, have they seen this before? Nope. They haven't seen it before. And so I think that's a huge skill. And when you ask about how do you train that skill? I think it's knowing all the tricks. Mm. That really is what it is to me. Because reading music, you A, have to have a good ear. But it's about knowing the simple theory things. Like, for example, when I see a song, I look at the key signature. Like, I want to know, okay, we're in the key of F. There's one flat. I know that. I've learned my theory enough to know that that's what it is. Well, gosh, I see my note is a C. Well, that's the fifth. I know that that's a five. Bum, bum, bum. So I know what my starting note is going to be. And... That's not cheating. That's being smart. That's going, I got to mm-hmm. use all the tools around me. And again, as you as you do it more, you feel the pattern of what your part is mm-hmm. and stuff. But there are ways that you can go and get resource for, resources for yourself and you can train yourselves to know, well, this is what a perfect four feels like. Bum, bum. I know that's a fourth. Those things, as simple as they may sound, are some of the best things that I learned in college. Because yeah. I knew them. Just knowing but your boy, just, intervals. Just knowing mm-hmm. that stuff makes reading music so much easier. It does. And I think there are some apps that will help you with sight singing now, which is cool. You can yeah. kind of look that up. And um, and also, we've got some friends who have moved to town who are session singers and have great voices and their reading wasn't as strong. And they just went to town on sheet music and just sat at home and just like got, you know, woodshedded through all of those songs and learning to read. I'm so glad you're talking about this because this is one of the things that I am so passionate about that people coming up nowadays do not have an appreciation for. And that is literally just the simplicity of practice. Oh, Oh, my gosh. It's huge. There's a chasm between the people who actually take it seriously and they sit in their room for seven hours a day or however long. Yeah. Let me me address the people. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I I have a teenage daughter and we have this conversation frequently. And what I would say is that I've, I've seen it for years. I've seen kids come up who are like children of industry veterans and they have a great amount of raw talent, not an awesome work ethic. And I've seen other kids come up who don't really know anything about the music industry, but they're just so passionate about learning their craft. And they spend hours and hours. And they might not have as much raw talent, but every time without fail, I will watch them skyrocket as the other person with raw talent and no work ethic kind of sits back and and doesn't do the thing that they really wish they could do. And the fact is huge. The fact is this. I've said this for years and it's it's never changed. There are two people, two different kinds of people that do music. There are people that do music as a gig and there are people that do music as a career. Mm. You have to make the difference and decide which Mm. one you're going to be. Because a lot of times if you're a gigging musician, oh, yeah, man, I'll I'll practice this. I'm going to go. It's super fun. I I show up every once in a while. You know, I might not read well on the session, but, boy, the people beside me, they read well. And I'll just I'll go on their coattails and whatever. And it's just a casual thing. And you find that those people fade out. Then the people that do it as a career, those are the people that go, 
I will do everything it takes to know my skill mm. to the very best of my ability so that I can do this for a really long time. And those two different, it stands out. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing I would say that's important to Seth is having a really good demo reel. If you want to be a session singer, mm. have something that represents you well as a singer. It's something that we do a couple times a year. We'll do some demo days where we'll work, work with singers and kind of grab their top four or five, like the best 30 second clips of the best songs that feature what they do. Mm. And that's so helpful. Like I, we send them to producers all the time and we listen to them ourselves all the time when we're looking for talent mm. and having something that represents you. Now, what I'll say about that is don't do a song from every genre if you don't sing every genre well. Thank you. If you only <laughs> sing country and pop music well, then that's all we want to hear on your demo reel. We just want to hear the highlights of what you can do vocally within those genres. Mm. And I really would stress this too, really. If you're going to do a demo, I strongly encourage you not to do it on your own. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's for this reason. Yeah. You don't really have a good good meter yourself of knowing what is best for your voice because you're passionate so about a true. song you're singing. You know, so you we have artists that come in and singers and they go, oh, I love this song so much. It's so fun to sing. And we have to say to them, I get that, but you're much better in this genre. And by doing this on your demo reel, you're going to get work. Mm -hmm. So I get it. that yeah. I get it. You like that. That's awesome. Go sing it at home and, and keep working, and, keep working and growing it. But like our job when you work with somebody is to be your ears to say, I promise you, if you put this, and especially it's, it's even picking the right part of the song, because sometimes people are confused and they think, oh, I'm a tenor. I can rail a high C all day. Okay, well, that's great. But do you know how rarely that that is needed? Right. What we need to hear is the fact that you can sing in tune an F. You know what I mean? Right. So it's our job to hone you in and go, okay. That's like the equivalent of... That I can throw a football over the mountains. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? well, it, it totally, I know it sounds hilarious, but I'm telling you, it's yeah. just so true. And yeah. so that's why I say get with somebody because our job, we listen to so many demos. We can say to you, I'm sorry, that's cracking me no, up. Hey, I'm hilarious. laughing too because I can picture somebody. <laughs> right. Totally. <laughs> right. Exactly. But I mean, again, we want to give you the best chance you can to get work. And yeah. so yeah. having the right demo that features that. Yeah. And I've... I, Two of the producers that I respect awesome. more than anybody, like just from a vocal producing standpoint, have said, I know whether I'm going to hire a singer within 10 seconds of listening to their demo reel. Yeah. Mm. So also <laughs> lead with your best. Yeah. Um, but I really do think demo reels matter. Like it's not something to be like, here's this. Don't ever send a contractor or a producer like a, a bad recording of you singing live in a club. That's not going to be Or that you've ripped off of YouTube. And don't send somebody a, a demo that's nine and a half minutes long. <laughs> right. I mean, don't do that gonna, either. No, but we've gotten those. I mean, we've I mean, gotten demos from people. Probably after a minute. And, and a we half. get demos from people that email us and they're like, oh, listen, this is a YouTube video I did when I was a junior in college. And this is the audio recording from the camera that was way back in the balcony. Like, don't. you're you're it's doing a yourself a dis disservice. Yeah. You may be a fantastic singer. But there's no way that we're going to do that. No, and guess what? Tell. In 10 seconds, I'm done with you. Like, yeah. you may have a great voice, but I'm never going to get to that. Yeah, point. it's a professionality. So it's a, you have to represent yourself well in any yeah. career. So that's just your demo reel is your resume. Mm. I and mean, that's yeah. just what it is. You've got to rep yourself, represent yourself that well. So yeah. demo reels, that's, is that one of the services that 1026 provides for singers? It is. We so we yeah. offer, like she said, we do it about three times a year. And we're getting ready, I think, to do one in like probably, you know, November is probably mm -hmm. when it'll happen. Awesome. And what we'll do is I'll offer a couple days. And we usually give two to three hour blocks of time. So we usually only schedule two, maybe three singers in a day just because we want to be able to spend time with them. And what we have them do is, you know, Laura typically does this part is that she'll She'll navigate with them, hey, maybe bring these five or six things in, you know, and talk to the singer and say, hey, well, what's the style that you like and all this kind of stuff. And so we have them bring options and then they come over to the studio and, you know, we'll listen to them and have them sing through a few of them. And then we'll decide, hey, we actually only need three of these and these are the three we're going to use. And then we will do the demo for them. We'll get it all mixed down for them and then send it to them so that they can have it for their reel. Yeah, that's awesome. Um yeah, you, you've already talked a, a good bit about this, but I just I, I want to sort of end on this before we dive into our lightning round and, and before we do our deep dive, which we're going to be doing our deep dive on becoming a full-time session singer. 
We've already touched a little bit on this, but we're going to dive into what it really takes. If you're interested in the deep dive, go to madeitinmusic.com. You can sign up for the deep dives there. But I just want to end on, you know, because I'm a producer, I, I just can't stress enough. If you're a producer out there listening to this, when you try working with someone like David and Laura on bringing professional background vocals to a record, it is game changing. It's so important. So is there anything that you would like to say to kind of producers or, or anybody that would might be interested in working with you guys? I, I mean, what I would say is that I would say, you know, we're there to serve you. I mean, that's really what our job is, is like, I want you to feel comfortable when you call us that you're not just going to get three singers that happen to be available on a Tuesday at two o'clock. Right. You know what I mean? That yeah. is what sets us apart. I think when you call us, we're going to cater to you for you to t have the conversation with us to go, well, it's country, but it's not really country. It's a leading a little more pop. I mean, this is what I need. We're going to dive in and really carve out the right sound for you so that we can hire the right person for you. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's what I want producers to know is that we're willing to do all of that for you. We're willing to do vocal arrangements for you. Mm -hmm. We're willing to book the studios for you. We're willing to audio movers and Skype. We're willing to do anything it takes for us to be able to serve you. And we're also willing to work within your budget, you know, because every budget is different. Every yeah. every project is different. And so when you get to that point and you're ready to pull the trigger on background vocals, don't just hire your cousin to come and sing. Yeah. You know, let us let us carve it out for you and let us do something that makes your project special. Yeah, yeah and I would just add to that and say I, I kind of got into contracting by default because the first person that I started contracting for was a producer I worked for a lot. And mm. he and he's a very well-respected producer and he's amazing and vocal arranging he's killer but what he would do and he would tell you this if he was sitting here is he would just hire all of his favorite singers for a session and we I got like two or three projects in and I was like I can help him with this yeah and so I, I went to him because I felt like we had a strong enough relationship at that point and I was like I think I can I think I can make this better for you and, he's, yeah. and, he, and now he's like I just put all my favorite singers in the room and sometimes that's not the best deal again because right. it goes back to like what are the best puzzle pieces it was like a to, sports team you need every position well, and there's people. Absolutely. There's also people that he didn't know. That's yeah. another thing for producers. The, I network. promise you this. I promise you, there are singers out there you have no idea exist, exist. Yeah. that we know and are really, really, really good singers. Yeah. And so I think you just open up your world to so many more people. And that's what happened with this guy. And boy, when he when he found it. His world changed. Yeah, and he, I mean, he says that. And I think, too, and Seth, you can speak to this, so I don't, because I'm not a producer, but I feel like what we bring to producers who are primarily musicians is really unique. There are a few producers out there who are have more of a vocal background, but the vast majority of producers we work with are primarily musicians and not singers. Sure. And so to bring that specific mindset to a project, I think... I've seen it like take a big giant load off of producers before. It's like, oh, totally. we don't have to worry about that. We know that you're gonna do what you need to do to make this sound great. Yeah, and we just know it's gonna sound awesome at the end of the day. Yeah, so and I think that's huge. part of what we really love to to do for producers. Yeah. So good. Well, um, are you guys ready to close with the lightning round? Let's We're ready. Do it. All yes. right, we'll get an answer from each of you. Rapid fire. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Chocolate. Cookies and cream. If you weren't pursuing a career in music, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, probably like cooking, interior design, that kind of a thing. Okay. I would probably be in real estate. I love homes. All right. Yeah. Uh, favorite artists when you were growing up? It was Whitney Houston for me. Mm. Mine was Lauren O'Harris. So both some good singers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would your perfect vacation look like? Beach. Ten days or more. <laughs> and not a lot to do. Like, mm -hmm. not super action-packed. Chill. All right. Mine would be the mountains in fall watching football. <laughs> Good. Perfect. Who's your team? Well, I'm a huge Florida Gator fan. Okay. Big college fan. There you and go. she's a Georgia Bulldog. So, I mean, it almost yeah. was it almost broke us up. But, I mean, we're... we're... I'm, a, I'm Ohio State, so I can't no. really... That's okay, you guys are, hey. are going to start playing, <laughs> I'm right? I married a Buckeye. We were so... supposed to have. I don't know if it's actually no, no, no. going to happen. Oh, no, I it think y'all are coming back. It got, it, voted back? On, yeah. it got voted on today. You're it's coming, coming back. back. You're coming back, baby. Yes. Best news I've heard all day. Yes. yes. Well, there you go. Amazing. And lastly, what is your favorite season? Fall for me. I love it. And I love college football. I love all the food things about fall. I love the leaves changing. I love the Christmas in the air. It's my fave. 
fall. And our daughter, our youngest daughter's name is Autumn. And so she says it's her season. <laughs> Sweet. I love it. So if people want to learn more maybe about your in-session classes, your demo reels, or just working with you guys with 1026, how do they get in contact? Yeah, so you can go to our website, um, www.1026musicgroup.com. Spelled out? Yes. Spelled out. 10, like T-N-T-W-O. Yes. S-I-X. And then also you can follow us on Instagram at 1026 Music Group. Also, we have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel that you can follow along as well. And then if you want to send us a demo reel, if you want to be considered to be a part of what we're doing, you can send all of that information. The website will take you there, but you can send it specifically to booking at 1026music.com. Awesome. Music group. Music, yeah. yeah, music group.com. Sorry. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Well, like I said, we're going to be doing our deep dive on going full time as a session singer. So head over to madeitmusic.com if you're interested in that. David and Laura, thanks so much for being on the Made It Music podcast. Thanks for, thanks for having, having us. us. It's fun. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It Music podcast season three. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from season three, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here.